Well, this is going to be an interesting one. The Long Patrol. Oh, comparison of future warships for the RN, RAN, RCN, and RN, a Royal Naval, a Royal uh, New Zealand Navy. Hmm. So I have a feeling I'm going to run into some people who are going to be upset with me at some point in this. So far, judging by the comments, I haven't managed to hit in, in, bump into many of those. I'm still quite surprised by that. I thought I managed to step on a few quite large minefields, but, you know, life happens, especially when you're dealing with current affairs. And there is part of me which does think that I, I, I should retroactively, you know, do a Dracula film and have an end date, but there's also the fact that I do like doing these current thing, affair things occasionally when I think I can do them right with history. And I think I can do this right. Because... And the point I'm trying to get across in all this is these nations are both very different, but at the same time have very similar needs from their different interests in terms of warships. This is not necessarily going to affect in their fit, but in their operational requirements, the scenario, the hull design. Okay, that That's one of the things that really got into and especially came about in the Horizon project. The kind of oceans which the French and the Italians were planning on operating on and thinking about operating in primarily. Okay, you have the capacity to go into other oceans, of course you do. But as World War II shows with the Atlantic bow versus the non-Atlantic bow for the Germans, you can start off with a perfectly good bow design that's fine for occasionally going into certain oceans. When you are overwhelmingly more successful than you expect you were, and you capture large portions of the French coast and the Nor and Norway, and suddenly operating the Atlantic is not going to be an occasional thing, but a regular thing. Ooh, Sugar. Need to fix that one. It's the same when you start to look at the Horizon Frigate Project and the Type 45. Now, of course, the big problem with the Type 45 is not enough are built, but also there's the fact that they're always build these billion pound warships, and they're not. A, you have, honestly, it's probably missing out some of the funding because there was all the money put into the Horizon Frigate, Frigate Project, which eventually bled off technologies into Type 45s. And originally they are planning on building 12, well, then it goes down to about 9, and then 8, and then eventually 6 uh, actually built. And the problem is the development costs. So, we call them billion pound warships. The actual average price per unit, and this is on the six that are built, is 400 million. If you built 12, they get cheaper, as happened with the Type 23s. They go from roughly 180 million a unit to build at the beginning down to 60 million a unit to build at the end because you know everything in advance. You can order everything at the cheapest rate. You can stockpile it, put it in, and boom, 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 it's done. There is nothing you're going to have accidents with or miss that. You're going to know exactly what you're going to do. Just go straight through. Oh, we built it. You're literally paying for the steel. You've got everything else in place. So there is that reality. That never ha gets to happen with the, tr oh, with the Type 45s as they don't get cheap enough. And the development costs are, of course, then added on top, are divided per unit, okay? So they're called billion pound destroyers, but 600 million per unit is development costs, which are 3.6 billion over six units. Now, if you divide it over 12, that'd be 300 million. And if their average cost goes down to, let's say, 200 million per unit, we'd be talking about almost half a billion pound destroyers, not billion pound destroyers. See? The mass really does change. And this is the Canada trip. Um, I know Drax has been advertising this as well. I've been mentioning this quite a lot. So if you're in Canada, when we're there, we would love to see you. Uh, we have dinner with Canadian fans, which is already put in for the Saturday and is being organized as we speak. Um, Stafford and Wayne are sorting out. There's a link to my Discord channel down below. That channel has in it, that server has in it in a channel which is all about the Canada trip where you will find updates and you will find things about what we're going to do, where we're going to be and where we're going to have dinner. Uh, there are public lecture, there's going to be all sorts of things going on. 
we are looking forward to it. Okay, we are really looking forward to it, and I hope we're going to have a lot of fun. I also hope that things work out as they're supposed to, but we'll leave that to one side. I'm feeling fairly confident about mm, three out of four of the ship visits. One of them, they've gone quiet on me, so I'm having low-level kittens, which the fluffs do not appreciate. So, why did I accept the future on a history channel? Well, because I'm going to grant in history. I'm going to look at their strategic situation. I'm going to look at their historical norm, their current defense and political standing, and working for that, I'm going to put forward what they are likely to do and what they should do. Now, during the live, I was very cautious and didn't really go into what they are likely to do. Naughty me. I went into what they should do, and I talked about where they are. What they are likely to do is more contentious, and it's in many ways better for me to deal with in the medium of a long patrol than a live when I'm answering questions live in the chat. Because I'm less likely to get distracted by interesting questions. Which happens. You produce them. And I'm like a moth to a flame when it comes to an interesting question. This is why I'm... You know, I, I like doing seminars where I sit back and I let my students have the debate and I put in points and I make sure they've done the reading and I make sure there's a presentation and, you know, chat away with them. I like seminars. I get to be part of a conversation of history and that's the fun part when you're teaching history, you're doing seminars. Or tutorials. Lectures are cool too, but you have to remember lectures are pretty much a performance art. And in the nicest way... Any academic who tells you lecture is not as much, uh, not about it being performance art mm, probably doesn't have to teach that big of lectures. Which is me being very cruel. So, sorry. It's not put down. I don't know. Not a put down. But, no. Um, <clears throat> Smallest lecture theatre I you tend to work in these days usually has about three to four hundred students in it. Which... Is fun. You can imagine how big the theatre is with three to four hundred and the sort of COVID rules. Anyway, Australia. Strategic position. Well, they're their own continent. They have their own emu or overlords. I know people talk keep talking about the Karabaras and various other things and the kangaroos. But it, there are very few countries on this earth where the human nation state can say they have lost a war against one of their animals. And that animal was not the cockroach or the rat. Which basically just outbreed everything. No. The emus won. Fair and square. Population lives mostly on the coast. The economy is dependent upon largely the export of raw materials, but also commodity trading. So they have a large financial sector, a large legal sector, services industry, but also raw materials. They don't really have that massive industrial section, which is problematic. Um, it causes them problems in terms of their acquisition and their maintenance of skills in within the acquisition cycle when they're on a, when they're not acquiring stuff, which is one of the problems they're seeking to balance and also one of the areas where i think there is advantages in terms of collaboration and one of the things i do see with the type 26 class is there is advantage in collaboration with them being to an extent de-risked for australia and canada by them being built by other people uh, parts of them being built by other people in first you know so britain's building its type 26 is its city class first and yes, those classes are not going to be the same. They shouldn't be the same. Okay, all these countries have different reasons. But it's kind of like when we talk about the Leander class, or if we talk about the tribal class before them, or various other classes. These nations have a habit of buying 
ships which are similar, but the fit is different because the fit fits their needs. And that's a good thing because if you try and say Canada or Australia have the identical of each other or the identical of the Royal Navies, that ship would not fit their needs. And it's uh, vice versa, if you transfer to Mediterranean, it wouldn't fit the Royal Navy's needs. They would be going, it's a good ship, we're not going to say no, but we're going to have to reevaluate some of the things we do. Because it doesn't fit with what we do and how we do it. And there's nothing wrong, because everyone has their own peculiarities, their own se scenario, which affects how they need the ships to be fitted out. Which is a good thing. Strange enough for Australia, and this is the thing I find most strange, is they're one of the world's critical uranium supplies down here. This uranium supply is absolutely critical. This is on, of course, the wider exclusive economic zone map. And yet they don't have nuclear power stations. They're now getting into nuclear submarines. They're sort of talking about approaching it, possibly. And you sit there and go... Okay, I realize coal and gas and a few fossil fuels have employed a lot of people and do employ a lot of people in Australia. And I realize there is far more of a legacy on that side of the world than on this in terms of the effects of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But if Japan went with, we're going to have nuclear power stations, why does Australia not even have one? You can point to the expense of sustaining a nuclear industry if you only have one. But again, we are talking about one of the world's, if not the world's, premier uranium supplier. Supplying the better, highest quality. Some of the best, qual uh, best ores you can get. Australia. They have a nuclear industry, just not nuclear power generation. We have Canada, which has Russia as its border on two sides. And honestly, you could almost say Russia on all sides, but on one side they do have Norway, Finland, Sweden, their NATO allies getting in the way. Greenland helps a little bit, but yeah, they have Russia above them and Russia to the directly to the uh, west of them. And, well, to the east of them, <laughs> thanks to the Atlantic and some helpful touches of Scandinavia, they don't quite have Russia, but uh, they're basically the one over. And the trouble for Canada on this front is that the one part of the Russian military which doesn't seem to be being sucked into Ukraine is the high northern components, mainly because they're possibly too specialist to send south. Them and their vehicles. Possibly the personnel will end up being sent south, but the vehicles won't be. We'd hope not for their sake. Anyway. The thing is, we are talking about Russia, which has tried to lay flags on the bottom of underneath the North Pole on the surface of the sea, surface of the ocean. Uh, it's a constant battle of wills, not just with Russia, also with Denmark. Okay, there are issues with Greenland. It caught, there, there is a ritual exchanging of alcohol going on on certain islands, which means. Canada has to be present there. They have to, otherwise they don't have it. And then we have New Zealand. The smallest of all of them. A population smaller than London. I am saying this to put this in context. There is the very real f fact that if you add all of Canada's population to Australia's population to New Zealand's population, you get a population not that much greater than the population of the United Kingdom. 
so they have to adjust their cloth to suit. Uh, the questions I often get are sometimes that there are some fantasy fleets I almost which come through, and they're not fantasy fleets because if you consider them, put them in the context of World War Two, the fleets they generation generated in a, a world war, they are not crew numbers etc. match up, but Short of a world war, those numbers aren't coming back. So you have to think about a fleet in relation to that. What are you likely to have? And also, the thing, the thing is that in a future world war, the odds are if you're going to get any ships rapidly into service, they're going to be trawler-sized vessels. Not that far, they're similar to flower class. And they're probably going to be uncrewed. And they're going to be forming task groups around crewed ships which are at the centre, providing the coordination, leadership, human verification, and probably the maintenance crews, which will flop over, uh, flop over to them on a helicopter or rib to sort something out if they need to. That's realistically what you're looking at for a convoy war. Uh, you know, it's when we're talking about carrier battle groups. We've talked this discussion many fruit, uh, many times at Billetrons. I honestly do do look at vessels like Albion and Bulwark, like the new Trieste class LHD, and I sort of sit there and go, should you have some sort of thing at the front which allows you to take drone uh, uh, uncrewed ships in to you, or do we just have the docking system back? Do we modify a bay class, and so that be, and make it sort of so it can keep up with a carrier battle group going at full battle rattle? You know, have a bay class designed to that, and so that the drone ships can go in, be rearmed. Because again, one of the interesting questions we had is, we can't rearm VLS at sea. We can't. With surface ships, they have to go home to be rearmed. Well, someone did came up and said, oh, can't we do a floating dock? Someone was going, well, no, you can't do that with a floating dock and a crewed ship. But if your uncrewed ship is the size of a trawler, you could, if you had its hull, etc., designed right and the dock designed right on a bay class vessel, have it go in, have a crane inside that could load up. So you wouldn't have wind interference, you wouldn't have movement interference, you could have even guide systems come in, or you could actually have it almost like a stand flex system where you take out the entire container of missiles put them down somewhere else and put in a new container and plug and play it and goes back out the sea. And then you, I don't know, Raz with a replenishment ship, get some new missiles and they're on the bay class, they load it up. That is an actual viable thing that you could do with current technology. But don't expect it to be a quick reloading process. It's not going to be. United Kingdom was a Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Legacy of empire, legacy of colonialism, but <laughs> this isn't the map which scares me most. Not when it comes to Britain's trade interests. Britain is a global trading nation. In fact, all these ones are global trading nations. They're dependent upon the global trade. They're dependent upon the global market. When there's a hiccup in the Straits of Hormuz, Britain catches a cold. When the Suez gets blocked, out, blocked up, Britain has a panic attack. When there are issues in the South China Sea, you watch the uh, various indexes on the stock exchange. That is what the reality is of being a globally connected nation. And before anyone says this is new, this is globalism, it's only new in globalism if you think it hasn't been going on since 1800s. Before that, probably, but news travelled slower. So, you know, there are advantages when news didn't travel as far at the pace of electricity. When people had to get their news by rumour and by... Uh, ship sailing in. It helped.
Australia historically has often realized that their defense lies in naval power. There is, of course, one poor exception. A little country just there north. <sighs> Honestly, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, all those areas, they have to... Australia has to maintain a special relationship with them. It's kind of like um, Micronesia and the various islands in the Pacific. Australia and New Zealand have to maintain a relationship with them. They have to, because that is their strategic debt. New Zealand and Australia can afford the security systems they choose and the costs they are willing to pay in defence, largely because they have debt. That means that it is not a short-term engagement. You are going to win some battles, lose some battles, and there are going to be diplomatic upsets. But it means you have to be continually engaged. One of the interesting things about the Australians I've been watching recently is that OPVs are increasing in size. And that's a good thing, because for years, when they got rid of their carriers, now they've got LHDs back in service, but when they got rid of their carriers, their frigates, especially, and their destroyers definitely became capital ships and are treated as it in terms of their deployments. And yet they didn't have the patrol vessels to step up the occasional visits. And believe it or not, there are island communities which are just too small to have a large frigate visit on a regular basis. I'm not saying it's the equivalent of a cruise liner turning up, but... Um, it can drain a lot of resources from an economy very quickly, and it can destabilize its finances very quickly when you have warships turn up on a regular basis. When they're big warships. It's going to be interesting, the British OPVs, which are going to be based out of Singapore, exactly how they operate and how they start their engagement. <laughs> My betting is they start by going around a lot of islands and saying hello. And they are going to be Britain's forward base presence for many years to come. And they're going to build up to a level which then they're probably going to be joined by a Type 31 in the fullness of time. There'll be a Type 31 which will take the place of HMS Montrose in the Gulf. And there'll be a Type 31 which takes uh, which goes and joins the flotilla in Singapore. And they'll probably be the rest will stay in the UK. The question of whether one of them tends to wander down to the Falkland Islands to back up an OPV as a guard ship down there is going to be an interesting one. Because if you're maintaining groups in a cruise in terms of the model, a model of what we're maintaining with Montrose, you pretty much need another ship back in the UK and you need almost the equivalent of three crews to cycle it through. Now, if you have three forward, deployed and you have two back you can sort of still maintain that especially if you consider whilst you can have forward maintenance in singapore and you can have forward maintenance in bahrain having forward maintenance in the four islands isn't exactly possible so the odds are you'll either be coming back to the uk for any dry docking maybe alternating with the OPV for that, or potentially heading across the South Atlantic to South Africa, in which case there will need to be some building up of relationship with South Africa to support that and sustain that. Because there aren't that many facilities in South Africa for the dry docking of something the size of a frigate, and it will need to be a sustainable operation. Although that does lead to other options. It's kind of like, again, with Canada, with New Zealand and with South Africa. Both could be good markets for the light frigate program if the light frigate is kept going. So Type 31, Type 32, Type 33, Type 34. If they just keep a constant frigate factory of light frigates coming through. They're either be selling off ones they don't need, uh, once they don't need as new ones join, or... They'll be selling other versions of new ones to them. If they can keep it going, if Britain can keep it going, it becomes a very viable thing for building up a sort of Commonwealth light frigate program. 
but are nations which want something which is a frigate, but either don't have the need or the financial depth and infra uh, naval infrastructure to go for a tippy top unit. And I very much see the British Light Frigate program as pursuing quality affordable. I think that's going to be quality at an affordable price, or the affordable quality you can do, that you can we can deliver. Who knows? We'll see. Canada. Canada's history is, of course, amazing. They built up the third large navy in the world. They were involved as much as New Zealand from the get-go of World War II, and they were a critical force throughout. Both of them were. And yet that gets forgotten. Canada had such a powerful navy. Canada... When you talk about the uh, the theory of them getting battleships, etc., prior to World War One and dreadnought battleships and various other things, people look at you and go, Canada, really? Yes, really. You're talking about a navy which was, in terms of hull numbers, in terms of tonnage, third largest in the world at one point. It's something that makes me think. When you think about it, the Allies in World War II have the two or three largest navies in the world on one side. That's how they fight the global manoeuvre conflict that is World War Two. And when I say global manoeuvre, it's global manoeuvre of logistics and, mo uh, and goods to keep these industries going, to provide them the sucker they need to fight the battles. These three navies do it. The vast majority of the top ten are from the Allies. They are massive. And all of them, all these navies play their part and fight these battles. And they all have an illustrious history. New Zealand has a cruiser navy. And in many respects, they are the true punchers above their weight. I know Britain likes to talk about we punch above our weight, but Britain doesn't. Let me explain why it doesn't. Britain has a humongous level of exposure to a global system. We're not punching above our weight. We're paying just enough to maintain the level of weight we need to tr compared to our level of risk to that system. And some would argue we're not paying enough because we're including things like pensions and war memorials, which should be paid for and should be maintained. I support those, but I don't think should be included in the accounting of this is the defence budget. This is what we're spending on defence, so we're making our 2% sir. We are. No, we're not. And, again, when I ha suggest any of these nations should could pay more, because this gets into discussion with Canada in a bit, I am not saying going higher than 2%. Yes, I myself think the figure should be roughly 25 to 3%, but there is a lot you can get on 2%. There is a lot you can get on an honest 2%. A lot of capability. And you have to, in many ways, sort out what you're getting before you can start spending more. Britain. As mentioned, doesn't punch above its weight. It's punching the necessary level of needs for its exposure. New Zealand doesn't have the large cruiser navy it had. It doesn't have fighters. It doesn't have, as in fighters, as in air defense fighters. It doesn't have a lot of the things which you would consider standard for a modern nation to have. However, they are also a member of Five Eyes. In fact, four of these nations, all four of them are members of Five Eyes. Which is, of course, an intelligence sharing organisation. 
it has several alliances it's committed to and it does maintain a very well trained very professional force for the size of forces it has they have an excellent disaster relief capability and again one of the questions which came when we're debating this and comes up is oh should we be prioritizing defense or should we provide uh, provi uh, prioritizing disaster relief because this is more useful that is a false dichotomy that is like and i used this one in the live and i will use this again deciding whether you should prioritize the police or the ambulance service here's another one the fire service do you prioritize any of these three organizations in funding or do you fund them all to the level you need to at any point, do you turn around and go, oh, we shouldn't be funding the fire service, we need to fund the police. Or, we shouldn't be funding the, uh, the police, we need to fund the ambulance service. We shouldn't be funding the ambulance service, we need to fund the fire service. You don't. And I'm going to a wedding which is going to have a lot of farming at, so trust me, I, I realise what I'm risking by actually mentioning those words. don't want to be in that scenario. You can't be in that scenario. One deals with one form of disasters and issues and that. One deals with another form and the other deals with another. And they're often complementary and often fill in and assist in each other roles, but they're not the experts in their roles and you need them. Let's gr grind us up to national level, well, international level. What are your levels? What are you talking about? What's your ambulance service? What's your fire service? What's your police? Well, your police are probably your armed forces. They're going to deal with the breakdown in international law and order. What is your ambulance service? Well, let's be honest. They're your medical. Uh, they're your disaster relief. In that, oh, there are people dying and crying. We need to get them out. We need to sort them out. All that sort of thing. What's your fire service? Probably a diplomatic corps. You need all three. If you prioritize your military over your diplomatic capability and your disaster relief capability, well, you have a very good military, but you won't have a lot to do, be able to do when things go as a bit help build relationships in peacetime, which you're going to need alongside you in wartime. But if you prioritize your disaster relief and your diplomatic stuff and don't have a military, then when people are looking around they're feeling scared, they're going to go, you're my gr great friend, you're a great ally, we really love you, but you can't look after us, and you can't help us. And that's the trouble, really. Because you have to balance the two. And often, defence is going to look expensive. Because defence often includes very big ticket item purchases. Canberra class LHDs, as ugly as they might be. Hobart class destroyers. <clears throat> Again, what is it with the Australian Navy and picking ugly looking ships? We'll leave that to one side. Capable, but ugly. And then we have our frigates and eventually the Type 26. And again, the Hunter class, this is going to be cool. The Australian Navy has got good ships at the moment. They have got a good idea of what they need to be. They have an excellent thing called the Sea Power Centre, which produces these wonderful documents. And always worth reading. But they're also sitting there in a tr problem. Because for the Australians, they like to build things in Australia. But they don't keep up a consistent build rate. They don't, and they don't keep up consistent investment. So they have boom and bust. And because of the way they're accounting, they they always start to say, "Oh, we're spending far more than other people are on this," and it's supposed to be the same program. A, it's a different fit, so it's not going to be exactly the same. B, if you're comparing even to Canada, you're in trouble because Canada's maritime industry is in many ways leavening off their neighbour to the south because there's a lot of places for shipbuilders to go and get work that keeps a very sustainable infrastructure in terms of personnel maritime infrastructure you don't have to suddenly train up and build up teams 
you have a lot of technology, you have a lot of ongoing research which is filtered through from the south, which helps with your costs. In the UK, they tend to we tend to keep manage to keep a consistent building, something get, being all doing at all times going. We have an ongoing submarine program. The astutes are starting to wear, uh, wind down, and so the dreadnoughts are winding up. We have a fairly consistent shipbuilding program in terms of there always tends to be something under construction. Yes, there tends to be breaks between that construction, but it's not that long. It's more a changing of tools. And currently, we have two frigate programs under construction. Low rate production, very slow, the most expensive form of it, but it's under production. Canada has advantages. They are building these new supply ships. They've got the Halifax passing service. Canada tends to, uh, ever since the tribal class destroyers, go for a one-size-fits-all. We're going to call it a name which is politically correct and acceptable. But it's basically going to be a cruiser standard. It's not going to be called a cruiser. It's not going to be a cruiser. But it's going to be a light, light cruiser. It's going to be all singing, all dancing. And we're going to have them in enough numbers that we can maintain the two fleets. Because Canada, unlike Australia, cannot go round. You can't send the ships around it. Then it's a credible distance for the Australians to have to do. So, in the nicest way, is one of the reasons why the SSK program ran into so much trouble is because of the distances between their own bases, let alone the distances to where they have to actually want to get to. And it's a case of, yes, we can get that far, but how long will you be actually be able to be on station? How long will it take you to get there and get there back? How much supplies, therefore? How long will you be on station? And then how long till we have to cycle out enough one to replace you on station? So how useful are you going to be? This is where the nuke boat starts to win with Australia. It's transit times to and from station and length of time on station. For Canada, they basically have to have two fleets. You could argue they basically have to have three fleets because they have to have a, a whole nother set of ships for the Arctic. And let's be honest, submarines are your basis for that. They are critical and are useful for that. But they aren't a panacea, because you need to also be present on the surface. And that causes you issues. It also causes them issues. It really does. But also, Canada has a problem in that they are always going to compare their build costs and their construction to what their neighbour down south is building. And the problem for Canada is this. If you want to build exactly what your neighbour down south is building, and you want it at those costs, then you will have to order it from your neighbour down south, and you will get it at those costs, because you'll be basically buying into their build run. But you won't get ships which necessarily suit your needs, and you won't get ships which necessarily suit your crewing requirements. And that's the really big thing that connects these four nations, when I'm looking through it. They all require the crewing requirements to an extent of a European navy. Star Navy, I the lower crew, less of personnel. The US Navy probably should be heading there, but they're heading there very slowly. Connies are gonna be leading the way. But the thing is they need the same at the same time they need the military capability and the real how do I put this politely? They are facing the likelihood of fighting of the US Navy. So there are some, and the likelihood of fighting, and I have to add this in, in certain other conditions of the US Navy, i.e. the high North Atlantic, the, high, the South Atlantic, i.e. rough seas, the South Pacific, the Arctic, the Antarctic, those waters are waters they have to consider they might actually have to do some fighting or at least operating in. And that's the big difference. And as I mentioned again earlier, the Horizon Frigate Project versus the Type 45 Destroyer. When you look at it at a certain point, it's how off uh, the biggest, the, all the differences, and it's a very subtle one, it comes down to how often do you think you might be operating in really, really rough water? Because if you think you're going to be operating in the North Atlantic and the North Sea on a regular basis, and the South Atlantic on a probably or a possibly regular basis and on a deployment basis, maybe, you build the ship differently than if you think it's going to occasionally be operating there. 
and that's also part of the thing that's caused some of the trouble with the Type 45 is because they were to an extent designed, there were power pack options considered, and please someone learn the lesson for the Type 26s, please let it be learned for everyone, you know, if now use this option on scalable power pack to actually add in more power, because it's a scalable power system, you're able to add in more power. If you need to make the hull a bit bigger, you make the hull a bit bigger, you add in the power. It's useful to have the power, not like doing Type 45s, we're adding in the power, extra power now. Because of the cold weather, it was be fine, uh, cold waters, etc. It would be fine to operate. You, you need more power when you're operating in hot weather. Why? Because you need more power to run the cooling systems to keep all your computers cool. Computers, the cookers of the world. As he says this, talking from an office in his garden, which is kept warm mostly by a single little laptop. And then we have New Zealand, which is building has been building really quite an interesting naval force, but they have a problem. These, the centerpieces of their naval force, are getting old. They have Canterbury. Canterbury is a great design. Canterbury, honestly, I would prefer an Absalom class, because they've basically gone for the Absalom role, and that's what she is, but she isn't able to perform as a third frigate. And it's sort of a case that I think it's a it, to me it's a missed opportunity. I, if they'd gone in with the Danish and basically gone, we want a th we're going to build a third Absalom class sort of vessel. I think that or something based on that idea. I think that would have been really quite sensible. Although then that would have definitely fitted with building a Type Thirty One style ship, either hood felt style, perhaps even with Stanflex and having the Stanflex scenario set up. Because I think. Again, for New Zealand, that sort of approach would be very sensible for them. And that would give them, usually, two fighting ships available. Which isn't a lot. It isn't a lot. But, yeah, one of them's got command and support facilities and the ability to move supplies and troops, as well as being a bit of a frigate. And the other two are proper frigates. Yeah, that's that's a force which works and works out. It's it's got you free. I'd like more, but I understand where New Zealand's coming from. And frankly, I would say the the thing I would worry about most if I was New Zealand from a defence perspective, apart from, of course, cyber attack, natural disasters, and those sort of things, is the reality that. Their defence for much of the time has been based on the fact that anyone coming to get to them has to get first through Australia, pretty much. And they weren't really a target. And that's fine as long as the Pacific is an American lake and they're allied with America. And it is fine. But if the Pacific is not, it becomes... Let's say not not an American lake, but a maybe slightly more disputed territory. They might find themselves having to pick sides. They'll probably they might try to go down the neutral route, but that might alienate friends, and they might and also alienate others who they wish to not alienate because they're a small nation. They wish to remain neutral. It's very difficult to be Switzerland. How do I put this? Switzerland gets away with being Switzerland because it's mountains in the middle of nowhere and it serves many people's interests that Switzerland is Switzerland. So, and the Swiss themselves are blooming hard to conquer. But, Switzerland has a population which is 8 million to New Zealand's 5 million is a far smaller territory, far more condensed, and they do have fighter jets. They don't have a fleet, but there again, they're landlocked. So, do I think New Zealand is going to have to start considering fighter jets? I think kind of like Ireland. At a certain point, they're going to have to start thinking, do we need 
something for the air intercept role that can go fast? Or do we have surface to air missiles? Do we get some batteries of those? Do we have something just in case? Or do we divest ourselves of all alliances and try and go to neutral route? But there again, it's far easier to be an armed neutral than it is to be and disarm neutral. Look at the experiences of Sweden versus the experiences of Iceland in World War II. Sweden's completely surrounded. And Switzerland. Surrounded. And they maintain it. Iceland didn't have that advantage. And it was the British who did it. Because the British looked at Iceland and went, if Germany gets that, we're in trouble. That's not nice. It's actually pretty nasty if you think about it. And the reality of Germany managing to get there, well, maybe they could get, I don't know, Bismarck could have stopped off there with a few hundred troops. But ultimately, British weren't going to take the risk. So what would I like to see them do? Now, what do I think they're going to do? What would I like to see them do? What I think they're going to do is continue stumbling along. I think they're going to continue stumbling along looking at their own programs. For example, I would love, I would seriously love to leech off the Australian land warfare program. I mean, seriously, British Army, you have had trouble with Ajax. Admit it. We all know it. It's not your fault in the extent that it was made, you know, all sorts of decisions were made, and arguably a good percentage of those were made because someone said anyone but BAE, and that locked you down a route which was incredibly difficult to go, where you're basically now the sole source buyer of a range of vehicles which are supposed to be custom built for you, but were originally supposed to be off the shelf and aren't and all that stuff. It's not on you. It's many, many decisions. It's many governments. It's many layers of bureaucracy's fault. It's a cultural issue. I think Think Defense, that very good blog on Twitter, said it best when they said it's many layers and it's an whole institutional issue and it needs to be fixed. I don't see it happening quickly overnight. I don't see it getting fixed quickly overnight. There is this land warfare program in Australia going, which... From all intents and purposes, and believe it or not, once a week I chat with a. I'm gonna say, uh, admit this, and I say, and say this is in my face, a naturally very angry Australian. When I and I don't mean this in a nasty way. He's not angry at sort of his own his family. He loves them. He cares for them. It's, it's right. But he's naturally quite angry at his government, usually at their mismanagement of things. And I haven't heard many good squeaks out of him from the about the land warfare program. In fact, he even once was mildly complimentary about it in that he said it wasn't totally awful. And that, for him, is quite polite when it comes to Australian government defence programmes. I mean, that's, that's, that, that's practically a ringing endorsement. So, yes, let's go see what they're getting and copy, shamelessly. What is Britain getting right? Well, I would argue Britain's going down roughly the right path with its frigates. And I think it's probably going to going right down the path with its destroyers. And I think we could go down a Commonwealth submarine program. And I think this could be a good one for Canada as well. And I, I, Canada actually has a nuclear program. Canada actually has nuclear infrastructure. Canada has a nuclear energy industry. So Canada could do this in many ways far more sustainably and quickly than Australia can. And honestly, they're going to have the same trouble trying to replace the upholders as the Australians are replacing the Collins because of the distances involved. And the thing is, we have to ask ourselves, what do they need? Well, they want to be sort of more British-style crewing than American style because it's slightly reduced numbers and every little counts when you're a smaller navy trying to sustain fleet operation numbers. 
They probably do want VLS, which the British don't stick in, but they need to start sticking in in the next generation. What can the British apply? Reactor technology? Reactor, and again, people go, well, Canada, are they allowed to? Are they not allowed to? If Australia's allowed to, I don't think anyone can really turn around and say to Canada they can't. And it helps if they do have them. Again, what you could do is you could have a program whereby Britain builds the reactors, the reactor core, uh, the reactor modules. They get taken to Australia or to Canada. They build the boats. Maybe they buy the systems from America. Maybe they buy uh, they buy uh, they develop joint systems with the British. It depends on their interests and their decisions. But if they want to go for the American systems, that's fine. The British can have the British systems. It's a very pragmatic approach to filling a need. And it means they get a sub which is good. And also they get to pull the expensive parts of developing a sub. And what are the expensive parts of developing a sub? Designing it, uh, hull design, hull shaping, uh, the sound uh, soundproofing, the, the systems to make it very, very quiet, all those things are incredibly expensive to develop. The research and development costs are really expensive when it comes to submarines. We are talking incredibly high tech. We're talking, okay, to make a, a an attack sub these days, let alone a ballistic missile sub, we are talking the highest level of technology we are doing. You cannot overstate the complexity that goes into designing and building a submarine, a nuclear submarine in the modern age. So one of the reasons why I have no doubt that we could actually build sustainable uh, sustainable systems for supporting life on the moon, etc. and Mars, we can build a submarine which works down at impossibly hostile depths and does so at speed while sustaining a reasonable level of comfort. Uh, yeah, we can get around these things. It's going to be difficult, but it's not impossible. Come on, frigate program. Two-tier frigate program. Makes sense. The higher tier, anti-submarine warfare slash, uh, honestly, not a destroyer or general purpose or light cruiser uh, <clears throat> frigate level. And the we want something that's quality at uh, we want something that's good quality at a good price affordable quality uh quality premium <laughs> and again when people sort of come around and go why does an ASW frigate cost as much as it does because everything's designed to be as quiet as it can be and still do what it needs to do at sea and stay afloat Rafting, and you raft everything. One of the funniest things, discussions I had with someone the other day about this, and this is, I don't think this is a secret. If it is, I'm going to get in so much trouble, but I don't think it is. Vibrations of cooling, of cooling systems for the actual computers. Okay? I'm putting this in as broad a term so it, I don't so don't get my friend in trouble because I don't think they'll tell me anything so really really super secret but I'm just going to be careful for their sake they were talking it through and the cooling systems are now having to get so powerful to keep the computers running at the efficiency they need to to process all the data they are collecting Again, none of that's a surprise that they are having to look into harmon uh, the harmonics and the sound management of those systems. You are literally talking about the level of, is there something we can put down on the decks which will deaden the noise of people walking? Because they are hunting things 
which depend on being quiet to live. Then we have a Commonwealth Destroyer program. Now, destroyers are getting bigger. Okay, Type 45s came into service, the Hobarts came into service. They were quite big destroyers in their period, but nowadays they're dwarfed. You've got the Type 55s, you've got the Zumwalts, you've got whatever the Burke successor turns out to be, but I think it's going to be a lot bigger than the CNO thinks that this is going to be. And if I hear another comment about a light destroyer program, there is going to be a very interesting conversation. Mostly between me and that CNO when I find him. We discussed this on Bilge Pumps. If anyone wants to go back and listen to the episode where me and Drac go into the whole Light Destroyer program and the issues of it, please do go find it. But, what are we talking about when we're talking about destroyers? We're talking about air defense, we're talking about task force leadership, we're talking about capabilities. Again, the British are already announcing a Type 83 program. That's going to be coming into service earlier than the Hobart replacement, but, again, the Type 45s came into service a little bit earlier than the Hobarts, broadly speaking. Therefore, honestly, the Type 83s are going to be a running program, a mature program, that you could base off as successors of the Hobarts quite successfully, especially if you're already sharing knowledge and skills because of the Type 26 programs. It would make more sense to run into. And if you get involved at the beginning, you could cheapen things and make things more, spread the research developments and the uh, costs. That, you know, instead of putting a massive air defense radar on an anti submarine warfare frigate and trying to keep it the same size as the anti submarine warfare frigate that the other Navy's building. Anyway. And again, we go back to the Type 45 project. The cost was all in the research and development. If you can spread it over more holes, if it's built in the UK, uh, holes for the RN, that's great. But if it's holes for the Australian, if it's holes for, I don't know, if the Canadians decide they want a couple of destroyers as flagships, then that's fine. They're currently building 15 Canadian service components, is what they're planning. And there is a debate as to whether they will all get the same fit. Um, they could end up being like the RN, which was it, actually they could end up being more like the RN than we all believe than you all currently think. And I have this little sneaking suspicion because, as we all know, the RN started out going, "We're going to build thirteen of these C one level combatants," and then it's gone, "We're going to build eight, and we're going to build five Type thirty ones." And I'm hoping we get at least a ninth Type 26. I'm hoping we get not more. I'd really love 12, but I will settle for 9. Because, to my mind, then that makes it a quite an easy sort of a set out of you have three frigates and two destroyers for each task group, uh, for each escort group. And you could, you've got three escort groups generally automatically, your forces divisible by three. But for the Canadians, if they get enough service commands, they might then decide, well, hang on, shall we go for light frigates and maybe get more of those? So maybe we can get, ooh, like nine or ten CSCs and then get eight Type 31s, or maybe we get some Type 83s, or something like that, to give us a four, uh, 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 give us an extra into our force. I think myself getting 15 CSEs is probably the best option for them. I would argue 16 is better, because in that, the two fleet problem, that gives you two fleets of equal numbers, that gives you a squadron of eight on each, each coast. That's what you really need, squadron eight on each coast. Guarantees your availability. Usually guarantees you the availability of at least three. Probably four. You probably have a case of two deployed, two available, two in uh, one in long term refit, one in short refit, and two in training or transit. If you have eight on each coast. 
but vessels provide a scalability. And then we get into the uncrewed systems programs. And again, this is an area where they could really work together because again, they have similar needs in terms of needing stuff which can operate for a long time at distance and provide a level of interoperability that is helpful. You know, one of the things that's often forgotten is the sheer distance put into these forces and these forces have to operate at. Britain likes to maintain and does need by necessity because of its exposure to the global economic system and the global markets, a global reach, a globally sustainable force, which means distance and ability to operate over that distance is a critical factor in procurement. And it's, again, one of the baits which comes up and it's one of the things I always find funny is when I'm hearing people go, oh, uh, we should build this service or that service or that service, I go, why? What are you doing? What is the one service? Um, the biggest proponents for a navy in your country, uh, if you're an island nation, should be your army. Because they aren't getting anywhere without sea control. Without the sea, transporting their equipment, transporting their logistics, they aren't de really deployable. You can deploy a small tripwire force by air, but sustaining it is going to be extortionate. Just look at what happened to Afgan Afghanistan and various other operations. Yes, we were flying in and out important stuff, but a huge amount of stuff had to go by other means. The vast majority by other means. And the scale of the airlift for the size of forces was massive. And very expensive. If we look at sort of we go with the Navy, you need you need an Air Force and you need an Air Force needs a Navy. Both of them need each other. Especially when we're talking about long range maritime patrol, we're talking about extra strikes, we're talking about. Well, here's one of the things yes, the Navy turns up, they fight. They maybe land a for amphibious force, takes an area, the Army comes and expands it, they set up an air base, the Air Force comes in. Why is that useful for the Navy? Well, then that frees up the Navy to go do other things. That means the Navy is no longer tied to that one place, and navies are vulnerable when they're tied down. When there's an operating pattern and they have to get into a habit of operating an area and they have to sustain forces there, that's when they're tied down and that's when they get vulnerable because the enemy knows where they are. And the greatest security, the greatest advantage for a Navy is the enemy not quite knowing where you are. And I know this is the point at which whenever I'm discussing this on Bilge Pumps, Jamie brings up microsatellites and all those things. I know there's a lot of them in the world. But they're not necessarily insurmountable. And there is the reality that to extent that's a game which can be played by both sides. And it's going to be interesting to see how it deploys out because we've got a near enough peer conflict happening in Ukraine at the moment. We've had a few of those happen over the years. Near enough peer conflicts. And information is proving critical. The informa uh, having the information, but also having the ability to engage and utilize that information to actually engage your targets. And the trouble is you have to fight a lot before you actually start fighting a war. There's a lot of deterrence, a lot of peace, a lot of other operations which you need to do before you fight a war. And then it's trade protection and movement, uh, conservation of movements. So, this cancer fleet interested me. Not as a thing that I would like to see formed up, because honestly that would just magnify any issues these navies had. But as something which shows you the actual combat power that four of the, the, the other four five eyes bring to the table. And you really realize the value of population in terms of sustaining your force. 
but you also see a legacy of wars of choice going on. And one of the things I find most interesting is, of course, after the Falklands War, Britain went up to ocean, fearless, and intrepid. They had three amphibious ships. And they had invincible, arc royal, and illustrious. They had three carriers. So for a while, usually you had a carrier and an amphib avail uh, 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 available, guaranteed, and usually either a carrier or a another amphib available as well. So you had three ships, and you also had Argus floating around there, which was a fifth ship, which was technically aviation capable, and you had, of course, the four bays, uh, well, before that, the many round tables, but then the four bays, so you technically had, you know, seven amphibious ships, and suddenly you started to see, well, there, there's always a good get ability to generate a capable task group, which is spread out of many hulls. That shrunk down because of the 1990s and to an extent the, fur, uh, the early 2000s. When it was the war on terror and wars of choice. We're only going to be fighting counterinsurgency wars. We're not going to be fighting peer conflicts. And over the last 10 years has been, in many ways, a slow realisation that peer conflicts never went away. We just had good reasons for using words rather than anything else. And the trouble is, the reason that we were using words wasn't because we'd matured as a civilization. Humanity hadn't reached the level of, oh, we have now ascended to a higher plane. Sadly, we hadn't. No. It was because the biggest, well, we could say the biggest collection of dogs on the planet, NATO, had a, significant, a, a sufficiently big enough stick that no one wanted to play with them. But honestly, it was because the biggest dog on the planet had a sufficiently big enough stick that no one really wanted to muck around with it. In relation to other people. And the trouble is, that stick's got a bit smaller, and other people's sticks has got bigger. And more importantly, you have... I would say, fundamental misunderstandings developing. And I would say the fundamental misunderstanding comes from both perceptions of necessarily Western resolve on matters, but also the Western's, West's perception of how their resolve is seen by others. Again, this can be illustrated by Ukraine, this can be illustrated by what happened in 2014, that can be illustrated by what happened this year. Diplomacy. And if we go back to the whole police, fire service, and ambulance service, again, scenario. For many years, there have been cuts in defence, and there have been cuts in foreign office, foreign policy, and, and the ambassador and embassy of staff. You've been, they've been cut away. Efficiency savings, whatever they want to call them, they've, they've been cutting them. And these have been, in many ways, offset by, I would argue, paltry increases in the ambulance services, in the sort of the disaster relief which were necessary. It's necessary to have a good disaster relief force, especially when usually you use the defence as a substitute for that, and so uh, they basically were it, and if you're cutting them, well, you need that, you need it. But the trouble is, you have an unbalanced triad, you haven't, they are, one isn't massively overwhelmingly funded compared to the others, it's just one has been slightly increased to more than it had previously, but still not a lot, and the others have, the others have dropped down quite a lot. 
And that means you start looking weaker. That means you start looking like you have less resolve. Because how can you be considered to be committed to foreign policy or to, uh, to a, na a nation as your ally if you haven't even sent an ambassador? If you haven't even attached a, a full embassy staff? If you don't even have a naval or military attaché there? How can you be seen as a, an ally if you have never visit, never visit, uh, send ships to visit that area? Or if it's, how can it be seen as your territory if none of your armed forces ever go there? If you haven't visited those islands? If you have no presence there? How can you be judged to have interests and commitments to allies in an area if you only turn up to see them, say hello once every couple of years? As I've said on this channel many, many times, decisions are made by those who show up. Not by those who shout, not by those who squawk, not by those who think they should be making decisions. The decisions are made by those who show up. If you're there, you have a voice in the room and a seat at the table. If you're not there, you don't matter. You don't count. No one cares. And to earn that seat at the table, to earn that voice, to earn that right to speak in your own interests and maybe the interests of friends requires consistent presence and consistently being there. Now, the thing I would like to see in this program, I'd like to see Commonwealth do, and the, these nations do is work together to be, make the programs more efficient for each other, to learn from each other where they have done programs well, to learn from each other where they've done programs badly so they can improve, and to produce things like ships with a common architecture. They're not going to have the same fit, as I started off doing, they're not going to have the same fit because they meet different needs. But they can have a common architecture, they can have a common network, a common framework, a common design principles, and common research in terms of hull design, shaping, power plant, all those mundane things, but are essential to making a ship work. And if you have a common foundation, you can then do your own fiddly-twiddly house on top of it. Right, thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed it. And, well, I do end these videos with a question. I'm going to say thank you to everyone for Super Chat. Thank you to Super Thanks. Thank you for... All the support, subscribing, sharing, more people who are patrons. Here's my question, and it's a good one, I think, for all of you. If, if you were in charge of sketching out a future plan that doesn't break the 2% and doesn't cut other services but allows them all to flourish in their own way what kind of program would you pursue if you were Australia Canada, New Zealand, or the UK. I put forward my idea, but I'd like to see your idea. Do you think nuclear submarines are a good way to go for Canada as well as Australia? I do, because of the distance involved, and I think it makes sense. But I'd like to hear your view. Do you think the OPV program perhaps offers another area for joined up, thing, uh, joined up work? Perhaps they could produce a common OPV. After all, OPVs are fairly standards in what we need from them. That can be fairly standardized across the whole name. That could be in almost a, a completely same ship. River class, batch three. <laughs> or technically, let's be honest. River class, batch one, batch 1.5, batch two, batch three. Yeah, roughly we're calling batch threes. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And uh, yeah, thank you. Take care.